Hi, let's get started. Um, hi, all you guys online, welcome. Uh, we're doing a special service uh, tonight uh, for our Sunday night service. We have a special guest speaker, and it is Jason Lyle. He's a PhD in astrophysics, and he's going to be sharing with us tonight. And so, um, just a, the study this morning, or the presentation this morning was just awesome, and we expect the same thing tonight. Um, we got a surprise for all of those who come in late because they want to get in here, you know, two songs into worship. We're starting right on time. <laughs> so, here we go. Dr. Jason Lyle. All right, well, it's great to be back with you this evening, and I get to talk about dinosaurs and the Bible. It's just a fun topic. It's not my area of expertise as a scientist, but it's something that I've looked into, and I, I know people who are experts, uh, who are PhDs, in, and have dug up dinosaur bones and things like that, and, and what a neat topic. And this is a great topic also, especially for youngsters, right? I mean, if you've got, you got young kids, especially if they're boys, they like dinosaurs. And uh, I'm sort of a boy that never grew up. I still like dinosaurs. I think they're pretty neat. And one of the things that uh, was really exciting to me is when I first learned how, uh, how dinosaurs fit into real history, the history that the Bible teaches. Because let's be honest, in most television shows and pretty much every, just about every museum in the world, dinosaurs are portrayed from an evolutionary perspective. And so we're told that they lived millions of years ago. Human beings never saw them. They may be killed by an asteroid, and, and uh, you know, long before human beings evolved, dinosaurs died out. Well, the Bible does have something to say about this topic, and it's, it's quite fascinating. And when I learned this stuff, it kind of got, it kind of re-energized my faith. I was already a believer, but it, it got me excited about the Bible again. And because, uh, you know, it, what, it kind of makes you wonder, what else have I missed in there? What other gems has God placed in his word for me to discover? And and uh, pretty exciting. And I think it's uh, very good timing for this topic because we do have the new uh, Jurassic World movie coming out uh, pretty shortly. So what a great time to use this topic, which will very soon be in, the, in you know, in uh, the, sort of the, the talk by the water cooler. Uh, why not use the truth about dinosaurs to show people that the Bible's true from the beginning? So it's always nice to start by defining our terms. That's always helpful. What are dinosaurs? You probably know that dinosaurs are reptiles, but they are different from modern reptiles in a couple of ways. Well, first of all, they're land reptiles, but we have a lot of other land reptiles. We have turtles and snakes and, and alligators and so on. Dinosaurs are different in two ways. First of all, they are land reptiles, but they had large holes in their skulls. They tended to, perhaps to reduce the weight. But the, the key distinguishing feature is number two, the, the structure of their back legs. All modern reptiles, if they have legs, because snakes don't have legs, but if they have legs, they, their back legs are out to the side in a sprawling position, okay? And you think of an alligator, right? And so it's got its legs out like that. Can't get more than a foot off the ground because it's got that sprawling gait. And that is a great design if you want to be able to lunge quickly, but it's not good for long distance. And so we think dinosaurs might have been better for long distance travel because they had their legs underneath their body like ours not like modern reptiles. So it, sometimes people have this, this misimpression that you know, dinosaur is just something like an alligator that got big or something like that, but they have a different structure. They're, they're a different kind of organism that no longer is around. And because they had that unique structure, that's what makes them interesting and different. And so their legs were kind of like ours, underneath their body, at least their back legs. Now, when we look at dinosaurs, as when we look at any topic, we can look at it from the perspective that the Bible is true, which is what we should do, or from the perspective that man's ideas about the past are true. And most people take secular history and they think about dinosaurs in light of what the evolutionists teach in terms of all life coming from a, uh, you know, a common ancestor over millions of years. And that's where you get the idea that dinosaurs lived millions of years ago and so on. That's not something that you see in dinosaur fossils. They don't come with labels telling how old they are. That's something that is imposed on the evidence. It's an interpretation of the data. So when secularists look at dinosaur fossils, they already have beliefs in mind. They already have some ideas about how to interpret the data. And they're thinking in terms of the secular view. When I look at dinosaurs, 
I start with what the Bible teaches because the Bible is the true history of the universe. And so if you're gonna draw correct conclusions from the data, you better start with the Bible. Now that's not to say we're gonna draw perfect conclusions because we're still fallible beings and we make mistakes and we don't know everything, but at least we're starting with something that we know is true and then we can draw some conclusions based on that. We like to summarize what the Bible teaches in these, what we call the seven C's. There are seven words that start with C and that's just a nice way to remember biblical history. And we begin with creation, where God created a perfect world, a world that he himself called very good. No death, no suffering in that perfect world. And of course, human beings were given charge over that, but then there was corruption. God gave Adam the freedom of, con the power of contrary choice. Adam could choose to obey or disobey God. And there's nothing wrong with that, but Adam disobeyed God, and that's when sin entered the world and, and death through sin. And so then we have catastrophe, where the wickedness of mankind became very great, and God decided to judge the world, because God is a righteous judge, and he is gonna judge sin. And so he judged the world with water, destroying every air-breathing land animal, and all human beings with water, except for those that were on the ark. God selected two of each animal, and there were eight humans that were on the ark that received God's offers of grace and mercy. Then we have confusion, the confusion of tongues that occurred at the Tower of Babel, and that res that's responsible for the splitting up of the, of the people groups very early in history. And that we think that's responsible for the different base language groups that we have today. Languages have changed a bit since then, of course. And uh, it also accounts for why certain groups have certain genetic uh, qualities, depending on what, what they happen to take with them when they spread away from Babel. Then we have Christ. God himself steps into history and takes on human nature. He's still God, but he's also man. And they can take our place on the cross. That's the next C of history. And that's where we should be, but it's where Christ took our place. Pretty awesome, the greatest exchange ever. We inherit his righteousness and he inherited our sin and paid for it. Pretty amazing. And then the seventh sea has yet to occur, at least in its fullness. There will be a consummation where paradise lost will be paradise restored. And that's something we all look forward to, but it's something we can only participate in if we have received Christ as savior. Uh, we can only be part of the new heavens and the new earth that will remain perfect forever if our sins are covered. And if our nature's been changed, to, and conform to the character of Christ. Well, you've heard of uh, virtual reality glasses that you put it on and you can see stuff that's not there. I like to think of the Bible like biblical reality glasses. It lets you see what is there. It filters out all the lies, all the nonsense, and allows you to see the universe the way it really is. And so when we think about dinosaurs, we need to start with the Bible. That's the way we should start any subject put on those biblical reality glasses, and what can we conclude about dinosaurs based on what the Bible teaches? One thing we can conclude is that they're made on day six of the creation week. Remember, dinosaurs by definition are land animals, land reptiles, and therefore land animals. And the Bible indicates that everything that creeps on the earth, all the land animals were made on day six of the creation week, therefore it follows that dinosaurs are made on day six. This is a very basic form of logic. This is a categorical syllogism. Dinosaurs are land animals, by definition. Land animals and people were made on day six, therefore dinosaurs were made on day six. And since humans were also made on day six, it follows that dinosaurs did live at the same time as people, despite the fact you don't see that in, in most uh, secular narratives. So they are made on day six, which means they're not millions of years old, nothing is, and they lived alongside people. And that bothers a lot of people because they've seen movies like Jurassic Park and they think, you know, what, wouldn't you know, T-Rex go around trying to eat Adam and Eve? We know what they were like. We've seen Jurassic Park. But uh, really, everything God made originally was very good. That includes dinosaurs. We don't often see dinosaurs in depictions of the Garden of Eden, but they certainly would have been there. Absolutely. Adam and Eve could have seen dinosaurs. There's no doubt about that. And they would have been peaceful creatures because everything would have been before sin and the curse. There's another way you could know that dinosaur fossils are not hundreds of millions of years old, and that's the fact that a fossil is a dead thing, and death came into the world after Adam sinned. We think most dinosaur fossils were created when they were formed during the flood year, when, when all those animals were killed and buried. But regardless of the details of when this happened exactly, it had to be after Adam sinned, and therefore they cannot be millions of years old because they're dead, and death entered the world when Adam sinned.
People think there's this scientific evidence that proves that they're millions of years old, that when you dig up a dinosaur fossil, it comes with a little label telling you how old it is, but they don't. They don't come that way. Those are attached later by people who were not around when the fossil formed and therefore do not know when the fossil happened. And I'm happy to talk about things like radiometric dating and the like. Of course, they don't date fossils anyway. They, date, they, uh, they use it on rocks, but in any case, those are guesses about the past. Is there scientific evidence that dinosaurs lived recently? Oh yes. Uh, think about blood, for example. How long do you think blood would last? Do you think blood would last millions of years? Not at all, and yet we found evidence of blood in dinosaurs and soft tissue. You're, what you're seeing here are actual photographs from the uh, inside of a femur of a Tyrannosaurus rex. The outer portion had fossilized. When they, when they cut open the inside, there was fresh material inside a dinosaur uh, leg bone. Isn't that interesting? And one of the structures that they found were blood vessels with red blood cells still in them. What you're seeing there on the right panel are actual red blood cells from a Tyrannosaurus rex. Isn't that interesting? And it wasn't the creationist that discovered that, it was an evolutionist. Mary Schweitzer found, discovered that. It was a great discovery. And uh, the evolutionists were just astonished. They're thinking, how, how in the world can blood last 67 million years? Well, it can't. <laughs> and by the way, you notice the blood cells are nucleated. Uh, see, we're, uh, mammals have uh, lack of nucleus in the, in the blood cells, and we're classified as mammals, so we do. But, but dinosaurs had nucleated blood cells. By the way, those blood vessels were still soft and squishy. After 67 million years, uh, totally unrealistic, totally unrealistic. So dinosaurs did not evolve. They were made after their kinds because all animals were. God made animals according to their kind. That's a phrase that's repeated 10 times in Genesis 1, according to its kind or according to their kind. We better take that seriously. And from other passages in scripture, such as the fact that God took two of each kind on the ark, that would seem to be the reproductive limit of an organism. So a kind is a group of organisms that are related to each other, but unrelated to other kinds. And so dogs and cats are different kinds. Uh, dinosaurs, there were several different kinds of dinosaurs, but, uh, and there were lots of varieties within a kind, but they did not evolve. And this is confirmed by the fossil evidence. This is a chart, it's actually from an, from an evolution-based textbook that shows how deep down in the geologic column these fossils are found. And in the secular view, deeper down is you know, hundreds of millions of years ago, and then higher up is more recent. And so what you're seeing here is the supposed evolution of dinosaurs. And you can see all the places where it's splitting, that's one kind changing into another. That's all, this, that's all the evolution. But you notice the, uh, the footnote there, highlighted areas indicate solid fossil evidence. So the areas that are highlighted, the, the light blue, that's where you actually find fossils. Where is all the evolution happening? All the places you don't find any fossils. Isn't that just oddly convenient? <laughs> there doesn't seem to be any uh, evidence of evolution from one dinosaur kind to another. There's variation within a kind, just like we have with animals today, but there's no evidence of dinosaur evolution. It just isn't there. This is from an evolutionary textbook. So what did dinosaurs eat? There's an interesting question. We have Tyrannosaurus rex. It had teeth up to six inches long with a serrated edge. Interesting. What did, how would the first Tyrannosaurus rex that God created have been described? Would it have been a plant eater, a meat eater, a scavenger, or a plant and meat eater? Oh, a lot of people get this one wrong because a lot of people say, well, we know what T-Rex ate. We've seen Jurassic Park. They eat lawyers, right? We understand that. <laughs> but that first T-Rex would have been a plant eater. That surprises people. But it's very clear according to the Bible because the Bible says in Genesis 1, 29 through 30, God's speaking to Adam and Eve. Verse 29, and God said, see, I've given you every herb that yields seed, which is on the face of all the earth, and every tree whose fruit yields seed to you, it shall be for food. God gave plants to Adam and Eve to eat for food. Verse 30, also to every beast of the earth, to every bird of the air, and to everything that creeps on the earth in which there is life, I have given every green herb for food, and it was so. To everything that creeps on the earth, would that include dinosaurs? Are they part of everything? Yeah, everything's part of everything, right? All the animals originally were vegetarian, and human beings were originally vegetarian. Now, 
If you had a hamburger for lunch, that's okay, because in Genesis 9-3, God gave permission for human beings to eat meat. So we're, you're okay on that front. But originally, human beings and all animals were vegetarian. Yeah. And by the way, there's another way you would have known that T-Rex would not be a meat eater, because meat, when you eat meat, I hate to break it to you, but you're eating a dead animal, and there was no death before Adam sinned. So there would be no meat to eat. Of course they'd eat plants. So the first dinosaurs ate plants. There's no doubt about that. So that first T-Rex, when God first created them, was vegetarian, not a meat eater. And that, again, that bothers people because he's got these incredibly sharp teeth. And indeed, T-Rex had these incredibly sharp. There's an actual photograph of the, the teeth on a T-Rex with that serrated edge, perfectly designed for ripping and tearing into watermelons and cantaloupes and all kinds of plants. We tend to think of something like a watermelon as soft, but you have to cut through that hard exterior to get to the soft stuff on the inside, right? We use something like a sharp knife, kind of like a sharp tooth, to dig into the interior, right? T-Rex could bite right into one, it wouldn't be a problem. Just because something has sharp teeth doesn't mean it has to eat meat. It may mean it has that option now that we're, we live in a post-fall world. But there are animals today that have very sharp teeth that are either entirely or primarily vegetarian. There's a particular primate from South America. You look at the sharp teeth on that guy, and yet he's primarily vegetarian, only occasionally supplementing his diet with meat. You, look, you take a look at this skull, and you look at the sharp teeth on that, and you say, well, that would have to be a meat eater, and you'd be wrong. And we, we actually know what this animal eats because its species is still alive today. This is the skull of a fruit bat. What do you think a fruit bat eats? Fruit, yeah. Now obviously at some point after sin, and we don't know where because the Bible doesn't give us a lot of details on this, but at some point some animals started eating meat because some do today. It would have to have been after Adam sinned because there's no meat before that. But it's interesting that even today, some animals that we think of as meat eaters will occasionally go back to their pre-fall diet. For example, the lions. Everybody knows lions eat meat, right? Well, there was an example of a lion who was raised in captivity. Her name's Little Tyke, 350-pound female lion. And she went her whole life without ever eating meat. There she is with one of her owners. She's a peaceful, gentle animal. And of course, they would try to give Little Tyke meat because everyone knows that lions need meat to live, right? You can see them trying to give her meat, and she's turning away from it. She doesn't even like the smell of, of raw meat. It's not appealing to her. She does like milk, however. And so she's not totally vegan. She'll at least eat, you know, she'll at least drink milk. But uh, meat, she never, she never ate it. She didn't like it. And it's interesting. That reminds us of certain passages in Scripture that, that prophesy this, that animals would go back to their pre-fall diet. Isaiah, writing about a time in his future, says the lion shall eat straw like the ox, indicating a vegetarian diet. Isn't that fascinating? And so maybe we're starting to see the beginnings of that. Pretty fascinating. So all, all the information we've learned so far has been what we might call an implicit teaching. It's something, you know, we know dinosaurs are vegetarian because all animals were. We know they're made on day six because all land animals were. But... What, what about specifically dinosaurs? And why don't we find the word dinosaur in the Bible? There's a very good reason for that. The word dinosaur is a modern word. It was invented in 1841 by Sir Richard Owen, who was a creationist, by the way. But the, uh, the King James Bible was translated back in 1611. The word dinosaur did not exist when the Bible was translated. So of course you're not gonna find that, that word, in, uh, at least in the older English Bibles. It didn't exist yet. But you will find the word dragon in the King James Bible and, and in other translations as well. Now the Hebrew word that is translated dragon in the King James is tanin. And, uh, if you, and I looked up all the references I could find to tanin and there are quite a few of them. And a lot of these could be dinosaurs or similar creatures like plesiosaurs that swam in the oceans. Technically a plesiosaur is not a dinosaur because dinosaurs are land animals by definition. But animals that would be included in dinosaur books like swimming, swimming reptiles, like plesiosaurs. Tanin's kind of a generic word. It can include lots of different varieties of reptiles, including these monstrous ones that we don't have today anymore. What about specific types of dinosaurs? Well, the Bible does mention those. At least I think it does. But they're not going to have a modern name, right? You're not gonna, they're not going to be called Diplodocus or Brontosaurus because those are modern names. But you will find the ancient original word for the creature, for example, behemoth 
which is mentioned in Job chapter 40, beginning in verse 15. And if you read the description of this behemoth, and by the way, behemoth is the Hebrew word, it kind of means beast of beasts. And uh, when we read the description of it, it sounds an awful lot like a sauropod dinosaur, one of the dinosaurs that had the long neck and the long tail. To get a little context here too, because context is important. We, we understand Job, we talk about the patience of Job, but if you read the book towards the end, Job, was, Job wanted to have a conversation with God. And uh, we, we certainly can't blame him. But uh, God answered him, beginning in chapter 38. And basically what God was saying was, okay, but before we have a conversation, let's see if you're qualified. And God then began asking Job a series of questions that Job couldn't possibly answer. And Job got the point. He says, I spoke without understanding. I can't contend with the Almighty. He understood. He has no right to argue with God. He, he has, he, he is, his job is to obey God. That's it. A lesson for us all. And in, in, anyway, in, verse, uh, in, in chapter 40 of Job, God begins comparing, well, it's not just there, but God begins comparing his power to certain creatures that he's made. The point being that, Job, if you can't even understand these creatures that I've made, how can you possibly argue with me? That's, that's the context. So this is a real animal that Job apparently saw and when we read the description, it sounds like a sauropod. Let's take a look at some of these verses. Verse 15, look now at behemoth, which I made along with you. He eats grass like an ox. So he's an herbivore. And apparently still at this time, this Job was written around 2000 BC, we think. So that would have been about 400 years after the global flood. And this particular variety of a dinosaur was apparently still uh, a plant eater. By the way, the secularists uh, used to argue, well, sauropods couldn't possibly eat grass because it hadn't evolved yet, because it's found in higher layers than dinosaurs. But then they found uh, evidence of grass remains in, 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 the, in the stomachs of some of these creatures. So it's kind of interesting. We know, we know that they're wrong now about that. Verse 16, see now his strength is in his hips and his power is in his stomach muscles. And that would be a good description of a sauropod dinosaur, which had very strong muscles along its belly to support its long neck and its long tail. That was needed. Verse 17 for me is the clincher. It says he moves his tail like a cedar. That's a tree, right? So he mo when he moves his tail, it's like moving a tree trunk around. And that would certainly match the description of a sauropod type dinosaur. Verse 18, his bones are like beams of bronze, his ribs like bars of iron. He is the first of the ways of God, indicating he's sort of the most magnificent thing God made. And indeed, we think sauropod dinosaurs were the largest land animal that God ever created. It says, only he who made him can bring near his sword. That reads a little awkward in English, but basically saying only God could attack this creature. If you come at it with a sword, you're done. It's going to bat you away with its tail, and that's the end of you. Interesting, and there are other verses too. We won't read all of them, but it certainly sounds like the description of a long-necked, long-tailed sauropod dinosaur. And it's interesting to me that, that some Bibles in the footnotes, you know, they'll have behemoth and they'll have a footnote, possibly an elephant or hippopotamus. Hmm. Well, first of all, the thing you need to remember about footnotes is they're not inspired. <laughs> it's the text that's inspired. The footnotes are, you know, somebody's, in this case, somebody's opinion. Uh, the other thing is, remember, this, this behemoth has a tail that moves like a cedar tree. Does an elephant have a tail like a tree? No, an elephant has a tail like a little rope. Does a hippopotamus have a tail like a cedar tree? Hardly. It has a tail like a little flap. Not even close. I can't prove for certain that behemoth is a sauropod dinosaur, but I can prove it's not an elephant or hippo because the description does not fit. Well, in the very next chapter of Job, we read about a creature called Leviathan. And it would seem to be one of these swimming versions that are technically not true dinosaurs because they're not land animals, but something like a plesiosaur, perhaps one that had the four flippers and the long neck and a short tail. When we read the description of it, verse one, can you draw Leviathan with a hook or snare his tongue with a line which, which you lower? It's a rhetorical question. Can you fish this thing out like you would catfish? No. Verse nine, indeed any hope of overcoming him is false. Shall one not be overwhelmed at the sight of him? Whatever this thing is, it's magnificent. It's terrifying. Verse 10, no one is so fierce that would dare stir him up. And you can see God making his point here. Who then is able to stand against me? Right? Job, if you can't even deal with one of my creatures, what makes you think you can deal with me? Verse 15, his rows of scales are his pride. So it's a scaly creature. It is a reptile. 
It says, uh, verse 16, that one is so near another that no air can come between them. Verse 22 says, strength dwells in his neck and sorrow dances before him. So again, that made me think of one of these long-necked plesiosaurs, perhaps an elasmosaurus. There were different varieties and a lot of them had those long necks. Indeed, strength dwells in his neck. You can imagine the, those, the muscles along that neck. Verse 25 says, when he raises himself up, the mighty are afraid. Because of his crashings, they're beside themselves. Verse 33, on earth there is nothing like him which is made without fear. So it's a spectacular creature, whatever it is. And it does seem to fit the description of a plesiosaur. Now again, some Bibles in the footnotes will say, you know, Leviathan, possibly a crocodile. It doesn't fit, does it? Strength dwells in his neck. Crocodile doesn't have much of a neck, right? When he raises himself up, the mighty are afraid. Can a crocodile raise himself up? Maybe a foot, but that's it. He can't get more you know, than a foot off the ground because of the way he's built with that, that sprawling gait. There are other verses I didn't read. You might, you might look at them later on your own that indicate sparks leaping out of its mouth and smoke going out of its nostrils. And so not only was it a dragon of sorts, but a fire-breathing dragon. And people say, well, that's got to be fiction, right? Because if it's, you know, if it's talking about smoke going out of its nostrils and breathing fire, that can't be true, right? Well, in context, the other animals that God has listed so far are real animals. And it, frankly, it wouldn't make sense for God to, to try and impress Job by comparing his power to a fictional creature. That wouldn't make any sense. So the context indicates this is a real animal. And to those skeptics who would say, well, I, there's no way an animal could breathe fire, I'm going to ask, scientifically, how do you know that? Because as a matter of fact, God has made some creatures that do very nearly that. There's a creature called a bombardier beetle that mixes two chemicals along with a catalyst in its abdomen. It's able to produce a hot spray that protects it from predators. There is no logical reason why God couldn't do that with a larger animal on a larger scale. There are lots of uh, amazing animals that the Lord's created that have amazing abilities. Think of, uh, think of fireflies, lightning bugs. Do you get those up here? Okay, that's one, of the, that's one of the nice advantages of growing up in, one of the few advantages of growing up in Ohio. We had, we had fireflies in the summer, and it was just delightful. These little insects that light up, it's fascinating. We don't really have them in Colorado either now that I live there. I kind of miss them. But they're amazing, amazing creatures. Or an electric eel, think about an electric eel. See, if you just found the fossilized remains of an electric eel, you would never know that it could generate hundreds of volts of electricity, but it can. There's no logical, scientific reason to reject the idea that an animal could produce something like a flame. No logical reason at all. What about flying reptiles? You've heard of things like pterodactyls and you know, th things of that nature, pteranodons. You know, the Bible mentions those as well. Very specifically, in Isaiah 14, 29, it talks about a fiery flying serpent. Isaiah chapter 30, verse 6, again, a fiery flying serpent. Isn't that interesting? And uh, it, I, I, I'm tempted to, I, I never know how much detail to go into, but the, the Hebrew words there are really interesting, and, and it's, they also occur in a different context uh, when the Israelites are in the desert. You know how they had the, had the problem with the, uh, the serpents that were biting them, and they had to make the bronze you know, serpent and so on and look at it to be healed? Uh, there's some evidence that it was not just terrestrial serpents like snakes, but it could have been flying serpents as well. I don't know for sure, but it, it's just intriguing. In any case, it's very clear that this was a, some kind of flying reptile, probably a Rampharynchus. There are different varieties of flying reptiles we know from the fossil record. The pterodactyloids had the really long wingspan and a very short tail. The Rampharynchus were small and had a long tail, and we think it's probably Rampharynchus. We don't know for sure, but it is a flying reptile. God knew about it, and this was long before dinosaur fossils were discovered. Dinosaur fossils weren't really discovered until the 1800s. So people apparently saw the actual animals at this point. So this then brings up the question of, were dinosaurs on Noah's Ark? And would they fit, right? Well, first of all, would they have been on Noah's Ark? What does the text say? Genesis 7, 8 through 9, of clean animals and animals that are not clean and birds and everything that creeps on the ground, there went into the Ark to, to Noah by twos, male and female, as, as God had commanded Noah. So are dinosaurs part of everything that creeps on the ground? Yes, they're land animals. They're air breathers. And so they would have been on Noah's Ark. They're part of the unclean kind, so there would have been two of each. And this is where the critics say, oh, this is ridiculous. Now you're getting silly. Dinosaurs on Noah's Ark, there's no way they could possibly fit. Because dinosaurs were huge, right? And, and you know, the Ark it couldn't have been that big. 
It seems to me there's two questions you have to ask if you're gonna make an argument that dinosaurs, along with all the other animals, couldn't possibly fit on Noah's Ark. Two questions. First of all, how big was Noah's Ark? And second, how many animals would have to go on board and how much space would they have to take up? Now the interesting thing is if you ask most critics who say you can't possibly get all those animals on Noah's Ark, if you ask them how big was Noah's Ark, usually they'll say we don't know. And if you say how many animals would have to go on board? I mean two of each kind, but how, what number is that? Usually they say I don't know. My point is it is not a logical objection to say you can't possibly fit an unknown number of animals on a boat of unknown size. That's not logical. That's emoting. Well, we don't have to guess about the first question. We know how big Noah's Ark was. It was huge. It was 300 cubits by 50 by 30. Enormous. Now, it, a cubit is the length from the elbow to the end of your hand. About a foot and a half. And there's some debate about exactly what number is that because, you know, different people have different length arms. But the minimum would be probably 18 inches, a foot and a half. This is a, even a smaller estimate. This is 17 and a half inches, the smallest possible cubit. Most likely the ark was about 450 feet by 75 by 45. Huge. And it, by the way, if you, if you haven't yet been to see the, the replica uh, that Answers in Genesis built in Kentucky, it, it, it'll give you a feel for just how big it was. It's wonderfully done. And it'll give you a feel for how big the ark was. See, many people have misconceptions of Noah's ark. And I'm sorry to say that some Christians kind of promote those misconceptions. Because a lot of times in children's books, you'll see the ark depicted like this little bathtub ark, all the animals jam-packed on board, all happy and smiling, even though the world's being destroyed. I never did understand that. But uh, that's not the biblical ark, folks. That's not the biblical ark. Why is it that most arks look like that tiny little thing when the ark that God designed had the same capacity as 522 railroad stock cars? It was enormous. You could imagine Noah's shock if God told him to build a little bathtub ark. Are you sure about this, God? God knows how to design the boat. And God designed it, right? Noah had to build it, but God told him at least the dimensions, perhaps other details that are not recorded, but at least the dimensions. And uh, God knows how to build a boat. He built the universe. It works pretty well. I think he can build a boat. You could imagine a little, you know, bathtub ark. That's yeah, not going to survive a worldwide flood. The ark that God designed and that Noah built did survive the worldwide flood. We're evidence that it did. We've had engineers study the design of Noah's Ark in terms of the dimensions and so on, and they found, unsurprisingly, it's ideally suited to weather a worldwide flood in terms of stability and, and not capsizing and comfort of the passengers and so on. If you change the dimensions of the Ark, it gets a little bit worse in one of those three areas. It's kind of interesting. So God does know what he's doing. So Noah's Ark was enormous, and we know how big it was. But was it big enough to hold all the animals? How many animals would have to go on board? And we know two of each kind, but the, people get a little confused there because uh, some people don't know what a kind is. Uh, a lot of people think, well, you'd have to take two Dalmatians and two Beagles and two Border Collies and, and two Regular Collies and two Golden Retrievers. No, those breeds are recent. You just need two dogs. You can get all those breeds later. And, and we know genetically, at least approximately, how that works. So there's only two dogs on board Noah's Ark. Only two cats on board Noah's Ark. Uh, if I'd been Noah, there wouldn't, there wouldn't be cats today. I just, you know, that would be the end of that. But anyway, by the way, the, the, uh, but when I mean cats, I mean cats. Lions, leopards, things like that, and that little thing you come home and pet, those are the same kind. We know from genetic studies, those are genuinely related. So there would have been two cats on Noah's Ark. They might have looked like a blend of the different kind of cats that we have today. And that little thing you come home and pet is actually related to that, that big African lion that you see. So my point is you just need two of each kind. And you don't need two of every species, two of every kind. You can get different species from a common kind. It happens. They're still the same kind. So likewise with the dinosaurs. You don't need two triceratops, two eoceratops, two pachyrhinoceros, two torosaurus. You need two of the ceratopsian kind. We think those are all like different breeds. They're classified as different species, but we think they're the same kind. There's an entire field in creation science called baromenology that studies what is the limit of the created kind. So although there are over 600 dinosaur names, we think there are only about 60 dinosaur kinds, okay? Because a lot of those are just different variations within the same kind. And uh, that means how many dinosaurs would be on the ark? Well, 60 kinds, two of each kind, because they're the unclean varieties. So it'd be 120 dinosaurs on Noah's ark, give or take. Not that many. 
In fact, that's dwarfed by the other creatures that had to go on. Studies have been done uh, to adding up the different numbers. John Wood Morapi, for example, did a wonderful study on this. And this is kind of, a, kind of an upper limit. We think the true number would be a little less than this. But at, at, at maximum, there'd be seven, over 7,000 mammals, almost 5,000 birds, almost 4,000 reptiles, for a total of about, about 16,000 animals on board Noah's Ark, 120 of which were dinosaurs. So they're included in this list, and other extinct species that we, that we know of. We, we try to figure out what their kind is. But, but again, people think, but yeah, but dinosaurs are so big. Some dinosaurs got big. Some dinosaurs never, never got bigger than a dog. Some dinosaurs never got bigger than a chicken, like Comsognathus. That's all the bigger it got. And we have fossils of these creatures. We know they just didn't get that big, some of them. The other thing to remember, and, and people often forget about this, but even the largest dinosaurs, that big sauropod that you see in the museums that goes the length of a building, hatched from an egg about that big. They didn't, they didn't come that big, right? They hatched small. They were babies once. They had, in fact, the largest dinosaur eggs we find are just a bit bigger than a football. And it turns out there are physics reasons why you can't make an egg bigger than that. You'd have to make the shell harder to support the weight, and then oxygen wouldn't be able to penetrate. So there's a reason why God built them in an egg that, that big, and, and they were pretty small when they first hatched, and they grew gradually over time into the amazing creatures that, that we now see their skeletons in museums. Now, given that the purpose of taking two of each animal on board Noah's Ark was for them to go and multiply, to preserve their kinds, right? The Bible says that, to preserve life. Wouldn't it make sense for God to maybe take some of the younger dinosaurs? Maybe, maybe not babies, but, but juveniles that had not reached their full size yet. Uh, perhaps young adults so they could go and multiply quickly. Why would God take senior citizen dinosaurs on the ark when he could take younger ones that wouldn't take up as much space? That would make sense. But in any case, uh, we can do the math. We know the amount of space available. 450 feet by 75, there were three decks. It's possible there were mezzanine levels, but we don't, we don't know for sure. But at least 100 square feet, or 100, pardon me, 100,000 square feet of space on the ark. We can calculate the amount of space taken up by birds, which is not very much, because most birds are small. Mammals take up the most space, because they're the most of them. The reptiles, including the dinosaurs, would take up less than 16% of the space on board Noah's Ark for a grand total of 46.8%. There's plenty of room on board Noah's Ark for all the animals when you do the math. And by, by the way, when I do this for kids, I often point out, because sometimes kids complain in math class, when am I going to use this stuff? There you go. When the skeptics say, hey, the Bible's wrong because this, that, and the other, you could say, no, because I know math, and I've done the, I've, I've done the calculation, and it, you're wrong. And this, again, this is kind of a, a generous upper limit. So, some estimates put it down to only about 30%. And it, which, in which case, all the dinosaurs could have been put on one deck of, Noah's Ark, of Noah's Ark. And that would leave a deck for Noah's sons to play football and a deck for Noah and Mrs. Noah to play shuffleboard, right? Keep in mind, they had to bring food and other things on board. So there, there was space for other stuff as well. So there's no problem getting dinosaurs on Noah's Ark. And they would have been there, which means they would have got off Noah's Ark, which means dinosaurs, as kinds, survived the flood. Granted, the flood killed off 99.99% of all land life, but there were representative kinds on board Noah's Ark, and they would have got off Noah's Ark and multiplied. That being the case, would we expect to find legends of people encountering dinosaurs in history? Of course, they're not going to be called dinosaurs. That wasn't invented until 1841. But would we expect to find legends of people encountering dragons? Because we do. There are a lot of, it's, it's fascinating to read up on this, to read the different legends of dragons that we find from around the world. And granted, now, now we're talking about uh, accounts that are outside the Bible. Some of them maybe have been passed down a few generations, maybe distorted a little bit, but maybe they have a basis in fact. There are lots of legends of people encountering dragons, and a lot of those could be dinosaurs. There's the legend of St. George and the dragon. There was a town that was being victimized by a dragon that was eating their livestock, the legend says the people were about to sacrifice a young lady to this beast, hoping it would leave them alone. And then St. George rides in on his horse and slays the dragon, preaches Christianity, and, and the town converts. They're very grateful to him for, for doing that. And, you know, we don't, it's not in the Bible. We don't know for sure that that happened, but it's entirely plausible. And we have found fossils of uh, baryonyx in that region in England. Those were discovered in 1983. So it's entirely plausible. 
Marco Polo in AD 1271 reported that the Chinese royal chariots were occasionally pulled by dragons. Oh, there are lots of legends of dragons in China. Apparently the thing to do if you were wealthy in China was to raise your own dragons because they were very rare at that time. So only the wealthy could, could afford to, uh, to keep them. And, and we know as a matter of historical records that in the year 1611, the Chinese emperor appointed the position of royal dragon feeder. We know that there was a job where your job was to feed the dragons, which makes me think they probably had some. Pretty interesting. And that's 1611. That's not that long ago. I mean, we're talking the year the King James was translated, or at least uh, published. There's a city in France that was renamed in the honor of the killing of a dragon there. The animal's described as being larger than an ox, armored, and had uh, horns on its head. It sounds an awful lot like one of the ceratopsian dinosaurs, like a triceratops, for example. There was a uh, creature that was killed in, in, um, in, a, in Italy. There was a peasant who was walking, his, his, uh, he had a cart with him and his oxen were pulling the cart and he was kind of walking behind them. And they stopped because there was a little hissing dragon on the road up ahead of them. This was not one of the bigger ones, this was a small one. But they were afraid of it because it was very brave and it wasn't gonna get out of their way. And this guy had a rod with him and he ended up uh, striking the creature and killing it. And then he brought the body in to a local scientist named Ulysses Aldrovandus. That's why we have such good records of this one, because he brought the body in for a scientist to study. And uh, Aldrovandus uh, indicated that the, uh, the carcass was unlike any other reptile he had seen. And he described it so precisely that we think we know what species it was. We think it was a Tanistrophius. So pretty neat. And we have good records because it was documented by a scientist. So if you ever kill a dinosaur, bring the body into a scientist so we can study it, okay? <laughs> Just saying. What about flying reptiles? We have lots of legends of those too. The Greek historian Herodotus, who uh, confirmed some of the events of the Bible actually. He said there's a place in Arabia, not far from the town of uh, uh, Budo, where I went to learn about the winged serpents. When I arrived there, I saw innumerable bones and backbones of serpents, many heaps of backbones, great and small, and even smaller. So he, he wanted to see these flying reptiles for himself. For himself. And he said, winged serpents. He's very clear, these are flying Serpent would be the ancient word for reptile. Winged serpents are said to fly from Arabia at the beginning of spring, making for Egypt, but the ibis birds encounter the invaders in this pass and kill them. And he, he documents too that the Egyptians were very grateful for that because they claimed that these winged serpents were poisonous. They would come and bite you and you'd get sick. And so they were very grateful for the ibis birds killing these creatures. They worshiped the ibis birds on that account. Uh, Herodotus continues and says, the serpents are like water snakes. Their wings are not feathered, but very like the wings of a bat. He's going out of his way to say, this is not a, this is not a bird. This is not something with feathers. This is, this is a membrane-like material. Kind of a, it's got skin for wings, and it's, it's a serpent, like a water snake. So it's a flying reptile. There's no doubts there. And by the way, the records that you hear of in, in this part of the world, in that area around Egypt, where you hear about these flying reptiles go all the way up until about the year 1600 and then they stop. So we actually think we know when this went extinct and it wasn't millions of years ago. We think it was about 400 years ago. Isn't that interesting? You don't hear that in mainstream media. It even appears on ancient coins. There are coins that depict flying reptiles, reptiles like a snake but with wings. Very interesting. You might know that people sometimes lived in caves it's one of the odder questions I get is, you believe in cavemen? Well, yeah, cavemen were men that lived in caves. Yeah. And it's a convenient place to live, right? Because you've got a nice shelter that's already there. You don't have to build it. Uh, Lot lived in a cave for a little while, according to scripture. And you know that people painted on cave walls, and they'll paint things like buffalo and humans, and occasionally things that look like dinosaurs. And here's, for example, a petroglyph of what appears to be a sauropod dinosaur. We've, we've enhanced it a little bit on the right. Otherwise, in PowerPoint, it doesn't show up very well. Uh, like, likewise, here's another petroglyph. This one's from uh, Natural Bridges National Monument, Utah. And uh, they say it doesn't photograph well, but they say when you're there, it's just obvious. I haven't seen it myself, but uh, friends who have uh, photographed it say, yeah, it's obvious when you're there. It, it just does, it's very clear, long neck, long tail, four legs. There are certain sculptures in France. They call them salamanders, interestingly. But they're, uh, we think they're actually probably dinosaurs because they're scaly, they're, they're reptiles. And you can see when you zoom in, you can see the, the actual scales of the creature there. And uh, some of them, you notice this one has, is fire breathing? 
It's interesting. And they match the descriptions of certain kinds of known dinosaurs. So it's interesting, they might, they might be just that. There are ancient tapestries that were, that were designed long before dinosaur fossils had been found, and that looks like a juvenile dinosaur, perhaps a, a myosaurus. It does look, you know, the proportions look about right. There are sculptures from China. This is thought to be about 4,000 years old. So this, is, this would have been during the time that Job and Abraham lived. And uh, it, it looks for all the world like a, a ceratopsian dinosaur, perhaps a, a centrosaurus, for example. And here's another one that looks for all the world like a protoceratops. They had the shield, but they didn't have the horns. Uh, very interesting. Bishop Bell's tomb. This is in Carlisle Cathedral. Now we know when the guy died. He was died and buried in, in the year 1496 AD. And uh, so that's his tomb. And you'll notice there are these brass strips along the side and along the top. And there was one along the bottom, but it's worn out over time. There's normally a carpet that is placed over this, and people walk along the carpet, especially along the bottom, and that lower brass strip is worn out. But there are carvings of animals in the three remaining brass strips, including bats, dogs, fish, birds. You can see those pretty clearly. And then these guys. Isn't that interesting? And uh, the, the top part's worn off there, but uh, if, if you zoom in, it, it, it does look an awful lot like a sauropod dinosaur with the long neck and the long tail. There's a temple in Cambodia, and I forget the date on this. I think it's uh, the year 800, if I'm not mistaken, 800 AD. It's an, a very ancient temple. This is long before dinosaur fossils were found, and it's got sculptures carved into it, right? And, and one of them, it just looks an awful lot like one of the plated kinds of dinosaurs, like a stegosaurus, for example, with those plates on its back. The Australian Aborigines, they uh, have legends of a creature that lived in uh, Lake Galilee in northern Queensland of Australia, and this is their painting of it. And apparently this one had died because you can see they've opened it up, they've examined the digestive tract there, and it looks like it's one of the four flippers with one of the flippers kind of behind it so you don't see it. It looks like a plesiosaur. It's really remarkable. Lots of legends of lake monsters from around the world. And uh, there's some speculation that some of these might even still be a, alive in some, in some parts of the world today. There's a creature that the, African, the natives in the African Congo refer to as Mokeli Mbembe. That's their name for it, Mokeli Mbembe. And you'll show them a picture of a bear, and they say, we don't know what that is. You show them a picture of a sauropod dinosaur, they'll say Mokeli Mbembe. And uh, so that's their, that matches their description of it. And the creature is said to kill elephants. So whatever it is, it's big. And eyewitness reports are as recent as 1990. And then after that, there's no more eyewitness reports. So this thing may have gone extinct very recently within our lifetime. That's, that's kind of amazing. In 1994, we, just, we made a really remarkable discovery, a discovery of what we call a Wallamai pine. And the interesting thing about this tree is this tree is found fossilized in the same layers as dinosaurs and not higher. So the evolutionists assumed that this tree had gone extinct and has been extinct for millions of years. And then in 1994, they discovered some of these trees still growing in certain locations in Australia. Which in, in, I believe they've now found three separate locations where they found these trees. They said it's like finding a living dinosaur. And I think that's fascinating because it's not like a tree can run away and hide, and yet it evaded our detection until 1994. Makes you wonder if maybe there might be some dinosaurs that are still around. That's a possibility. That'd be kind of neat. But uh, probably most of them, and perhaps all of them, have died. And that's, that's a question that people ask is, you know, what happened to them? What happened to the dinosaurs? Well, they died. Well, yeah, but why did they die? You've probably heard the story that a giant meteor wiped them out. We don't think there's any really good evidence for that. The, um, one, of the, one of the reasons that secular, astronomer, or secular astronomers and secular geologists invoked that theory is because we find a, a layer of iridium, which is a, a, an element that is kind of rare on Earth, but it is found in asteroids. We find a layer of it uh, kind of above the layer where dinosaurs are found. And so you have that iridium layer, and there's dinosaurs below it, and there's no dinosaur fossils that are found above it, at least not definitively. 
And uh, so that, they said, well, maybe you know, an asteroid impacted and it, you know, and it kind of split apart and distributed that iridium all over the world and it settled in and that's what killed the dinosaurs and that's why you don't find dinosaur fossils above that layer. There's a certain logic to that. But we now know that when asteroids collide, they almost never distribute their iridium. It stays in the asteroid, right? You can go to like Behringer Crater and, and, and search the surrounding areas. You will not find iridium around there maybe in the, in the actual asteroid, but it does not enrich the surrounding regions in iridium. What does produce iridium and enrich it? Volcanoes. Volcanoes will put out a bit of iridium. And so we think it might have been volcanism associated with the flood year that's responsible for that iridium layer. But that wouldn't by itself have killed the dinosaurs because there were two of each kind of dinosaur on board Noah's Ark, right? So it must have been something else. But the thing is, there's, no, there's, no, there's not necessarily any one cause for all the dinosaurs. There are lots of things that have gone extinct since the fall. Trilobites, these little creatures that used to fill our oceans. As far as we know, there's not one anywhere alive today. They're gone. There are, there are other creatures that have gone extinct. It's not just the dinosaurs. Why do, why do creatures go extinct? Well, there's lots of reasons. They could, there could be a famine that comes through and wipes them out. There could be a disease that comes through and wipes them out. Their immune system can't handle it. There could be a new predator that's introduced and that wipes them out. Um, all kinds of reasons why things go extinct. Hunted to extinction. I mean, you read all these legends about people going out and slaying dragons. It's entirely possible that human beings uh, caused the extinction of some of these kinds of dinosaurs. But in any case, the ultimate reason why we don't have dinosaurs is because of sin. It's because Adam sinned. Right? Because none of the air-breathing nefesh creatures would have died if Adam had not sinned. And we'd still have dinosaurs today. And they'd still be peaceful. They'd still be plant eaters today. That'd be pretty neat. But it, 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 see, this is a way to segue into the gospel. I think that's pretty neat. Because you can talk about why, when, when you find all these fossils all over the earth, what does this mean? You know what it means? It means God judges sin. Those, we think almost all the dinosaur fossils that we find were deposited during the flood year. It's evidence of the flood. It's evidence that God judges sin because he's a righteous God. And a righteous God would do no less than, than appropriately judge sin. So it's a way of reminding us that, hey, this is what we all deserve, death, death and an infinite death in hell because we've sinned against an infinitely holy God. And that's why we need a savior. So you can actually use dinosaurs as a way to introduce people to the gospel. There, I don't think there could be a better use for dinosaurs than that. We can summarize dinosaur history with the five Fs. We talked about the seven Cs or five Fs. Dinosaurs were formed. They were created on day six of the creation week. What about the flying reptiles and the swimming reptiles like plesiosaurs? They're made on day five, just one day earlier. Dinosaurs were made on day six, the same day as human beings, peaceful creatures and plant eaters originally before sin entered the world. Then there was the fall. Dinosaurs were fallen because Adam was given dominion over the world and his sin affected everything under his authority, which is all life on earth. Maybe some of the dinosaurs became meat-eating at that point. Maybe it took time. We don't know for sure. Then there was the flood. And we think all, just about all fossils on the earth with a few afterwards, but we think most fossils were deposited during that worldwide flood because the flood is, is ideal for, for forming fossils because it kills organisms and buries them quickly so they can't decay. That's how you get fossils. And so these dinosaur fossils, evidence of the worldwide flood. But there were representative kinds on board Noah's Ark, certainly. And they got off Noah's Ark and reproduced and faded. For whatever reason, dinosaurs after the flood, they, it seems like they never reached the same population density that they had before the flood, for whatever reason. Maybe the environment was different. We do think the environment was different before the flood. We think the world was probably kind of a subtropical climate almost everywhere. So, and that would have been conducive to large reptiles, but maybe the environment later not so conducive. And so over time, they faded. Some of them, apparently until relatively recent times, still existed. And finally, they were passed down by word of mouth. Some of them written down. And we have our modern conception of a dragon. The, perhaps the combined uh, traits of different types of dinosaurs that have been passed down by word of mouth. And then finally, dinosaurs were found. Dinosaurs were rediscovered in the 1800s. That's when we started finding fossils of these creatures and realized there were some amazing animals on this planet that we didn't, we'd forgotten about them. We didn't know about them, but there they are. The, the secular media, movies, television, what have you, they love to use dinosaurs to teach children about evolution. 
It's, it's amazing how early they start. I happened to catch a few minutes of this, this little cartoon called Dinosaur Train, and I was listening to it, and they were, it's, it's obviously designed for like kindergarten or younger, and they were talking about evolution, and I couldn't believe it. it wow, they, they start indoctrinating early. We need to recognize that Christians are not the only fishers of men. And as evolutionists can use fictional stories about dinosaurs to try and persuade youngsters that evolution's true, we can use the truth about dinosaurs to show them that the Bible's true. We can say, actually, you know, the Bible makes sense of dinosaurs. It talked about them long before we found fossils of these creatures. And there's evidence that they're, they're recent. The, 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 the soft tissue that we find, and it's not just, not just one example of that, there's many. See, that's what we're all about at the Biblical Science Institute. We want to reconnect the Bible to the real world because people have this impression that the Bible's just a collection of interesting stories with perhaps some moral value, but it can't be true because we know from science, millions of years and evolution. No, no. The science confirms what the Bible teaches when you understand it, including the science of dinosaurs. So again, we have our resources. We have them back in the, in the, in the back of the room there. Uh, this presentation, Dinosaurs in the Bible, we have that on DVD. Uh, one resource I'd encourage you, really encourage you to get, it's called The Ultimate Proof of Creation. I, I wish that every student would read this and study it before they go off to college. Because if they, if they know, how, this is really teaching you how to think properly. And if you know how to think properly, it doesn't matter what professor you get, because no matter what they say, you're going to be able to think it through. And if they say something anti-biblical, you say, ah, I see the fallacy there. I'm not going to be, I'm not going to be fooled by that. We've heard lots of um, sad stories of people going off to college and and they walk away from the church and so on. And maybe a lot of that could be prevented if we knew how to think right and knew how to give a bulletproof argument for biblical creation and, and the Bible in general, really. Uh, we did bring a lot of children's resources as well. I'd encourage you to get some of those. Uh, the, the answers uh, for kids, I really like that, that one in the middle. There's, there's multi-volumes of that. We still have volume one and two back there. It's a really great resource, very colorful and attractive, good answers and uh, that, that uh, good theologically and scientifically sound answers. I didn't write these, but... but uh, my friend Ken Ham uh, wrote most of those anyway. So, and then also, uh, we have some ones on dinosaurs as well. We have Dinosaurs of Eden. It's a great book for uh, uh, students. And for the younger students, D is, D is for Dinosaur. That's a, that's a nice resource that uh, will get them exposed to this and get them thinking right about dinosaurs from the beginning. Uh, don't forget to sign up for our free monthly newsletter. And do check us out on the web as well at biblicalscienceinstitute.com. So, thank you very much.